Good afternoon and welcome to How to Start a Shrimp Farm. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person due to a death in the family, but I still wanted to get our information out there if we could. So I hope you enjoy the presentation, learn a little something, and I'm going to get started with a little bit of history on us. And then I'm going to talk to you about what you're going to need in order to start a shrimp farm. This is a photo of RDM Shrimp and Greenhouse. This is an old, over 110-year-old barn that we are using as our, for our shrimp. RDM Aquaculture was established in July of 2010. When we started, we were looking to do tilapia. Uh, my father-in-law and my husband actually researched raising tilapia for about 15 years. They finally came across a shrimp operation that was a lot cheaper than the tilapia, all the tilapia operations that we had been looking at. And so they decided to go forward with the shrimp operation. When we started out, we actually assumed there were about 100 shrimp operations in the U.S. Little to our surprise, we were the third indoor shrimp operation in the U.S. When you're the third in anything, it's a little more difficult to get information. And since there's really not a whole lot on line for shrimp farming. So when we started, we um, had a consultant. We lost a lot of shrimp our first year, and we lost a lot of shrimp our second year. We had to learn how to do this through a lot of trial and error. A lot of mistakes were made, but we ended up figuring it out. And it did take us to about year three, year four, and we actually figured all this out. We actually use a system called ZIA, which just means Zero Exchange Aerobic Heterotrophic System. All it means is I have a bacteria-based water, which converts um, ammonia to nitrites, nitrites to nitrates. Nitrates in low dosages are not harmful to shrimp. So we actually manage our water to the very, very best of our abilities. We also run, when we started, we ran six production tanks and two nursery tanks. Right now, we are running 19 production tanks, seven intermediate tanks, and six nursery tanks. We are also hoping by the end of 2024, we will be up with the new building, running 24 production tanks, 13 intermediate tanks, and hopefully 10 nursery tanks at that time. We are continuously selling more and more shrimp, and we're very excited about it. We are struggling to keep up with what we can sell out the door right now. And we only do 100% retail sales out my door. And if anybody ever Googles us or sees where we're located, I am 30 minutes to the nearest town. I have to drive 12 miles to get a gallon of milk and pay about $6 for it. So let's get started on how to start a shrimp. There are several different types of shrimp farming that you can do. There are ponds, lakes, however you want to call them that you can do outdoors. Um, you can use fresh water, salt water. So there's lots of versions in which you can do there. There's also what we do, which is the heterotrophic RAS system, because we do use a recirculating system. And then there's also the traditional RAS system, which just means it's using clear water versus a bacteria-based water. So there are several different types in which you can choose from, but the one I'm mostly gonna talk about today is the heterotrophic RAS system or ZIA because that's the one I know anything about. We actually raise the El Vanames or the white leg shrimp. They are the most common farm raised shrimp. They are considered to be the hardiest of all shrimp to raise. I will be honest with you, we actually call them divas. And if these are the most hardiest shrimp to raise, I don't know if I'd really want to raise any other shrimp for that reason. They do not like any change of any kind. Their water quality has to be up to the max. Otherwise, they don't do very well. So that's why we actually test our tanks for nine different things every day so that we can make sure that our water quality is at the best it can be. And then the shrimp will do just fine. We also do not breed the shrimp at our facility. We actually use very reputable hatcheries here in the U.S. There are actually three of them one in Texas, two in Florida. There are actually several more, but those are the three that we use, they're the bigger ones. Um, we also try to get the um, pathogen-free species because they will do the best for you. They're actually designed to be more disease resistant 
And the more disease-resistant shrimp that you can get, the better they're going to do for you inside your tanks. I get asked quite a bit about breeding our own shrimp here. I would love to breed our own shrimp here. It's actually been a goal of mine for a long time. And part of that is because when we do such high survival rates, we do 70 to 90% in our productions. We do 95 to 100% in our nurseries. We do 95 to 98% in our intermediates. We kind of figured this out, so I really don't have much of a challenge anymore, and who doesn't love a challenge? But we found out that in order to breed, it really should be left up to the experts. People that have a lot of knowledge in this, they're really the ones that should be doing this. First of all, it's very difficult to do. It's not as easy as just putting on some mood music and some mood lighting and put a male and female together. There's a lot more that goes into that. So there you need the knowledge and how to breed them and what you need to do after they're bred. So for us, it just was best that we use the three hatcheries that are available here in the U.S. Um, so we do not choose to do that at this time. And to be honest with you, I really don't foresee it coming down unless we can get a lot more shrimp farms and I can make it a little bit more profitable on my end in order to do that. Caring and management of the shrimp, the PLs, your entire production, I cannot stress enough how important it is that you work your farm seven days a week, a minimum of three hours a day. There are daily testing that is required because if you don't test the water, you have no idea what's going on inside your tanks. When your heterotrophic bacteria develops, your water becomes brown. You don't get to see your shrimp. Um, the only way you see your shrimp is when we do what we call raking the bottom of the tank. That is the only way in which you get to see the shrimp. By seeing the shrimp, you get to see how well they're doing. But like a clear water tank or an aquarium, you get to see what's going on. You can see if you have dead ones. You can see if you have a lot of shells. With the brown water, we can't see any of that. So we have to let the water tell us what's going on inside the tanks. So we have to test daily. And we actually test for nine different things. Those nine things that we do test for, dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, CO2, alkalinity, nitrite, ammonia, and solids. We have got to know what those nine items are inside their tanks. Yes, there are a few other things in which you can test for, but those are the main nine things that we need to test for daily. Because by knowing what's going on inside the tanks, then we know how to properly take care of it. And I'll be honest with you, I learned I lost 400 pounds of shrimp in one day because I didn't test for four days. And when I went back to figure out what was wrong, of course, I found out I hadn't tested. So there was nothing for me to uh, compare it to. So I did a full test on those two tanks and found out that their only problem with those tanks was their alkalinities had dropped. And what was so frustrating was that if I added maybe a couple of tablespoons of baking soda, it would have prevented those tanks from crashing and losing 400 pounds of shrimp. So this is why we test every single day. I've been doing this for almost 13 years and we still test every single day. And I know it's like the most boringest part of this whole thing. And of course, you got to find a way that makes you want to do this testing. You've got to find that little niche or that little spark or something that makes you want to go out and test that water every single day. You cannot walk out there, look at your tanks and say, oh, I don't see any dead shrimp. I guess my tanks are doing okay. Because you may not see it that day, but by day four, you're going to start seeing a lot of dead shrimp. But you're also going to start seeing water quality. And, it, and I'll be honest with you. It's a lot harder to bring that water back than it did to destroy it. So we've got to maintain that bacteria water at all times. That's the only way we can ensure survivability and healthy shrimp. And that's what our goal is here, is to provide healthy shrimp, uh, survivability shrimp, because those are your selling shrimp. So by in incorporating a lot of best aquaculture practices into your facility is one good way of doing that. Now we're going to talk about harvesting. It takes 150 days to grow a shrimp from a 10-day-old PL that you get from the hatchery. 
Our shrimp will spend 25 days in a nursery tank, 25 days in an intermediate tank, and then 90 days in production days. So by the time they're 150 days old, they will be sold out the door. We also do a stocking density of 25 shrimp to the square foot. So for a 14 foot tank, we'll do a stocking density of 3,500. We will do a stocking density of 5,000 for a 16 foot tank. And we do a stocking density of 7,200 for an 18 foot tank. It's not exact, but it's as close as you're going to get for a 25 shrimp to the square foot. But you will also want to harvest them out live and sell them live if possible. And I'm not meaning that you have to fill a tank full of water and deliver it to a grocery store or anything like that. Live means they've been kicking within the last couple of hours. You want the consumer to be able to see the head on the shrimp because it will actually tell the consumer how fresh the shrimp is. I don't know if you all know, a shrimp head only lasts for two days on the shrimp. After day two, it's going to start turning black and it's not going to look very good and people aren't going to be wanting to buy that shrimp. But selling it with the head guarantees you the freshness of the product. Um, selling it out our front door, we do sell them live. A consumer calls, says they want two pounds of shrimp. We ask what time they're going to pick it up. We harvest the shrimp within 15 minutes of them coming to pick it up. If they walk in the door, they're going to have to wait a few minutes for us to harvest it out for them. But they are getting it live and kicking out the door. We pack them on ice and then we will send them out the door with them. So they're literally still kicking as they go out the door, but they will be dead in about 10 minutes or so. The thing is that by selling them live, we are kind of separating ourselves from that niche or the normal market of a frozen product. We get 20 to $22 a pound for our shrimp. So why would I want to sell it for $12 a pound when I can get that much? If I was freezing my product, I would not get that much for it. But by selling it fresh and live out the door, that puts us in a niche market. But my niche market, I average 500 pounds a month doing what we do. And yes, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of people freak out over seeing the head on the shrimp. I know. I agree with them. It took me two years before I could get over the head of the shrimp. But I actually cooked the head on the shrimp. The head adds the most beautiful sweetness into the meat. Uh, we, there's no deveining our shrimp. That's my absolute favorite part because there's nothing in their mud vein other than water, salt, and protein. There's nothing in my tanks but water, salt, shrimp, and feed. So there is no reason to devein the shrimp. The shells, because they don't need them actually for protection as they would in the wild, are very thin. You can eat the shells if you want. I personally like to do it because I'm a lazy eater and I just like to eat the shells. It's just much easier for me to do it that way. But it's a preference. Some people don't like it. That's totally fine. But the best part is you want to cook a shrimp with its head on. It adds the most beautiful sweetness into the meat. Now the head never touches my plate, but a lot of our customers love the head. I actually just had a customer the other day send me a recipe for shrimp head soup. I don't think I'm ever going to eat it, but you never know. So harvesting your tanks are, um, you're going to want to harvest them by size. So you can hand sort them by using a net. And that actually is the best way in which to sh harvest your shrimp. If you drain your tanks down to about 12 to 13 inches of water, harvest your shrimp out, you're literally just stressing them out. And when you fill the tanks back up with the, what's left of the remaining shrimp, they're actually going to die because they were so stressed out. So you're going to lose anywhere from five to 10 pounds of shrimp. Is it easier to drain the tanks? Of course. But to me, to do a little more exercise and build up the muscles in my arms, I would much rather harvest them out that way, just using a net, leaving the tanks full of water and harvesting them out. But we actually kind of, if we know we have large orders going out the door, we literally will turn the heat off to their tank, cool them down two degrees Celsius, which makes them a little lethargic. And by making a shrimp lethargic, they're way easier to catch than an active shrimp. So we'll harvest out however many pounds we need for our large orders. And then we will uh, turn the heat back on and the remaining shrimp, we might lose one or two shrimp just through the stress of them running around. But most of the time, we don't do anything. We just go out. We harvest the shrimp straight out of the tanks. We will throw them into an ice bath, pack them on ice in biodegradable containers, 
and send them off to our consumers. And they absolutely love it because we actually do on average over about 500 pounds every single month. How do I sell 500 pounds of shrimp on average every month? To be honest, I really don't know. I've never done marketing per se. We have a Facebook page. We have a website. We have, I mean, I go and speak at any um, Rotary Club or AARP Club or anybody that's willing to have me speak because I'll be more than glad to talk to them about the product I have. I also, if even if I'm in the grocery store, I talk to the cashier. I'll talk to the people behind me. Um, letting them know that we actually raise shrimp. And so, I mean, that doesn't cost me anything. And most of the time I get a free meal out of the deal. But marketing per se, we really don't do anything. Like I said, other than a Facebook page and our website. And word of mouth, that's our best marketing. Um, we have some flags out on the corner that let people know we have shrimp. So we do get a lot of people that will stomp in and say, we've always wanted to see what you were about. I mean, it may take them 10 years or so, but they're coming in. And they're telling somebody, or we have people that come in and say, oh, we were at somebody's house and we had your shrimp, so now we had to come and get it. I mean, that's the best advertising you can get. And if you ever see where I'm located, you'd be amazed that we do as well as we do. Because I'm literally in the middle of nowhere. I'm 30 miles to Lafayette, and I am 12 miles to the nearest town where I can buy a gallon of milk. And it's about $6 a gallon right now. And so... I really not near anything. I'm not even on my way to a Walmart or a Target or anything. So I'm literally in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by corn and soy. So we actually do our marketing um, through, like I said, maybe through Facebook. We advertise that we have shrimp available. So selling it is actually easy if you do it to a local market. Again, I know I'm in a niche market. I'm not on a commercial scale by any means. But we were actually in two restaurants in Chicago for almost six years. Um, they couldn't always get our shrimp because if we oversold here in retail, I was short for them. And they were also limited to how much shrimp they were able to get. Yeah, it was great when a restaurant would call you up and say, I want 100 pounds. But that's a one-time sale. You'll never sell to them again. Because first of all, they're only going to sell maybe about 40 pounds in two days. Remember, you want that fresh product. You do, you're competing against a frozen product, but if they have to freeze your shrimp, now you are competing with that frozen product that they can get for $7 a pound, and you're selling it for $20 a pound. Why are they going to continue buying a frozen shrimp at $20 a pound? They're not going to do it. So we limited our grocery stores to 40 to, or grocery stores and restaurants to 40 and 45 pounds a week. That's all they were allowed to get. So our restaurants, we actually had them put little inserts in so they knew that they had the shrimp that weekend on their menu. So that's how we got to it. But we also recommend for all of our clients, when you are starting out your first year, you need to figure out what your market's going to be. It's not as easy as saying, okay, well, they're doing really well doing retail. I honestly don't know how we're doing so well retail. I really don't. I, I just feel blessed. I, I honestly can't tell you there's, you know, X, Y, and Z as to why we're doing well retail. We just are. And we're very happy to be doing that. That's why we're actually getting ready to add on. But some people are in a location that they think retail is going to be their only market. And if people don't come out, retail isn't your business. So you may have to do farmer's markets or you might have to do wholesale, which are your restaurants and your grocery stores. Now, I'll be honest with you, if this was left up to my husband, my husband would hate the retail side of it. He hates it because retail, it's iffy. We might not have a sale for the whole week, but come on Saturday, we might do 60 pounds in three hours. We may have 200 pounds sold in a week to where we then can't sell to the grocery stores or the restaurants because we've oversold what we know we have. So for us, it's retail. I absolutely love the retail side of it because I like the people I get to meet. But my husband liked the wholesale side of it because... You delivered X amount of shrimp, pounds of shrimp every Thursday or Friday. You got to check the next day. So he liked that side of it. So, I mean, but you've got to figure out what you want. But we also highly recommend farmer's markets for your first year. And the reason for the farmer's markets, it's a lot more work. 
because we actually recommend, if possible, take the shrimp down there live. If you can take it down live, awesome, because now they know what kind of product you're selling. Two, if you can't, offer it up as a cooked product. Put it on a little, what do you call it, George Foreman grill and cook them up. Maybe get some vegetables from the other produces. So now you've got cross product uh, promoting going on between the other vendors and yourself. Put them on, you know, a skewer. Five bucks for three shrimp. That's a pretty good sale. So that's one way to let people know the product that you have. But farmer's market are people who are looking for that fresh, clean, farm-raised, local-grown product. That's the person you are looking for to purchase this product in the beginning. After that, it'll be just totally word of mouth. People will be tired of the frozen product, and they'll start coming in. Your normal Walmart customer, no, that's not your customer at this point. Now, when you decide to go commercially, you're still not going to want to sell to Walmart. You're going to be wanting to be more of a high-end grocery store or high-end restaurants because that's all we've ever sold to our high-end or farm-to-table restaurants. Those are the people you're going to be looking for. So that's why you want to market it as a local grown fresh product. Never use the term farm race in your marketing. The reason we tell you that, because if you go into any grocery store, look at their packaging of shrimp. It's going to say farm raised on it, but flip the product over. You're going to see in the very small print, product of China, product of Thailand, product of Vietnam. You're going to find that kind of thing because for Americans, when we see the packaging says farm raised, we automatically think of that farm just outside the city limits. They are actually not mismarketing. They are a farm raising shrimp. So it is farm raised shrimp. It's not using the term wild caught. But if you use the term local growing, they can't use that terminology unless the consumer know you're local. You're in their area. Who doesn't want to buy a local growing shrimp? That's the best tasting thing they're ever going to get. So that's why we tell everybody fresh, local growing is how you want to market your product. Okay, now we're going to talk about feed. I'm probably bouncing around here a little bit too much, but I'm trying to get you so much information and I only have so much time in order to get this in. I'm probably going to go over my time as it is. So feed, feed is a very short thing. Feed, we actually use a very high quality feed. It comes from a company called Ziegler in Pennsylvania. Um, it is a feed designed specifically for our RAS system. It is a sinking pellet, which is what we need for our particular system. It consists of 35% protein. Um, they're, what's actually in the food, it's fish meal, cornmeal, soy meal, and other additives that are necessary, but no hormones and no antibiotics, which is one of the things we absolutely love because we can promote no antibiotics or hormones are ever used in our product. And that is a huge thing right now. People don't want that in their food. I personally don't want it. So by offering that, um, we don't go through a whole lot of feed either. Because on average, we use one 55-pound bag of feed per 14-foot tank per month. You, some months a little bit more, some months a little bit less. It just depends on how the tanks are going. Because if we have water quality issues, we actually correct the majority of it using the feed. So if we can cut back their feed, the shrimp don't produce as much waste. It lets the bacteria clean up the, whatever's going on and do its job. Like I said earlier, we use the heterotrophic RAS system, which means we actually use swimming pools for our tanks. By using swimming pools, they were just cheap to get started in, and that's why we used them. And we get about three to four years out of each swimming pool. The liners themselves are fine. It's actually the legs that get corroded due to the salt air that my facility or that we all live in now. But by using the... Um, Heterotrophic system, like I said, we've actually kept our water for going on 13 years. We actually did not know we were supposed to discharge it. The other thing that's so unique about our system, the RDM system, is that we actually have no pumps or filters. Um, I know most of you have all had an aquarium at one time or a fish tank, and you all have probably had pumps and filters on it. You exchange your water every two weeks. We use none of that. We have no pumps, no filters, no protein skimmers, none of that. We only run on air only. Our air is being brought directly from the outside and the air is being pushed into our facility using a one horsepower or two horsepower regenerator blower. That's it. 
Um, we can use one on eight tanks. We use a two horsepower on our 12 tank barn. So we are actually just pulling the air directly from the outside. We actually have a filter on the outside of the building. So it kind of cleans the air a little bit before it comes in. It's pushed through the blower and it goes directly into the tanks. Now in the center of our tanks, we have what we call a volcano. The volcano is just a solid drum with an airline around it. It's designed to drag everything across the bottom, bring it back up, and disperse it back out. You can literally, when you're standing at the tank, you can literally see the waste and food coming across the top of the tanks. Now, of course, it's going to drop back down, but it's going to come back around like in a circular motion. But that volcano is not strong enough in the center of the tank to bring everything off the sides of the tanks. So we actually included these air lifts, which are just PVC pipes with an air stone. The air stones are designed to, again, to move the water around. So we have the air stone drop to the bottom of the airlift. It pushes water on the bottom of the tank. So now I have a circular motion at the bottom of the tank. Forcing water up through the PVC pipe. I'm literally producing oxygen in my tanks. And then I have the third current at the top. So we actually have three ways in which we're keeping our water in total suspension. Because if this water was to settle out, you will literally cause a thick sludge and the shrimp will literally die. So we have to keep it in total suspension so that the shrimp can survive and do healthy. When you're getting started, you need to find a location. A location is pretty important. Most people, they have farm or land, you know, near where they're living. That's totally fine. You can use an old barn. We converted a hundred year old barn and we added uh, two new barns onto the facility. So we've actually got two barns and an, and an old barn. But you can use a warehouse, school gymnasiums. You can use an old barn, build a new barn. There are so many structurals in which you can do. We're actually working with somebody right now in which we are putting this in the basement of a 100-year-old school building. It's really cool how it's turning out. But it, it's not your normal way of doing this. So the only thing we ask is that you must have your water tested because we need to know what's in your water before you get started. Um, you don't want zinc, iron, copper, magnesium. You don't want any um, pollutants or toxins or pesticides that can be in your water. If you do have any of that in your water, you are then going to want to have it filtered out. So once we find out what's in your water, then you can find out what filter is going to work with your facility. You need a very well insulated building. Um, we've worked with some people in greenhouses, but you really need to be in a certain environment in order to use the greenhouses. We ask that you, our buildings are actually, we have one inch of spray foam. We have the product R19, and then we have a vapor barrier, and then we have um, Duraplate or semi-trailer sidings on our walls. We have nine inches of concrete in the floor. And then I have 26 inches of R14 insulation into the ceiling, or excuse me, R40 insulation in the ceiling, vapor barrier, and then we have barn siding on the ceiling. That's how well insulated our buildings are. They pretty much stay the same temperature all year long, whether it's 105 degrees out or negative 55. Our buildings stay the same. But using a concrete floor with a, a trench drain or can drains or whatever but you do need drainage because you are going to be spilling water onto your floor when you're cleaning your tanks moving your tanks you're going to have water on your floor and you don't want that water settling because stagnant water is is a breeding ground for disease so you want the concrete floors for ease um you don't want to use gravel you don't want to use dirt because all of those are actually breeding grounds for diseases that could possibly go wrong in your facilities Okay, I sort of went over some of this a little bit earlier, but these are the things that you're going to need in order to raise your shrimp. You're going to need tanks. Uh, like I said, we use swimming pools. You can use concrete. You can use fiberglass tanks. You can use whatever you want. If you are going to use plastic tanks, we do recommend that you put a pond food grade liner in them because there is a toxicity that does develop between the salt water and some plastics. So you can use 14 foot, 16 foot, or 18 foot tanks. It's up to you. We usually like to start our clients out with 14 foot tanks because of the ease of working in them. But you're not going to make a whole lot of money off of 14 foot tanks. The whole first year is about building the bacteria. If you can build up the bacteria in the first year, then start expanding your operation. But of course, go to the larger tanks because now you're going to produce more shrimp. Because in a 14-foot tank, you can get anywhere from 120. This is based on an 80% survival rate. You can get anywhere from 100 to 20, 120 pounds 
every harvest. 16 foot, you should get around 200 to 220 pounds. Um, an 18 foot tank, you should get over well over 300 pounds every three months. So there's where your difference is at. But an 18 foot tank is very difficult to work in. And to be honest with you, I cannot figure it out. I don't know if it's because I think I'm too short or what, but it is much harder for me to work in an 18 foot tank than it is a 14 foot tank. Our new building is actually going to consist of all 18 foot tanks. I can't keep up with the demand, so I need to stay up. You're going to need regenerator blowers, horse and a half to two horsepower. Air system, that's just PVC pipe running across your ceiling. They must be four inch PVC pipes. The reason for that, there's a lot of reasons, but the main reason is, is if you use anything smaller, you're going to push the air through too fast that it's not going to heat up to room temperature. Because like I said, we're here in Indiana, we get a lot of cold air and I do not want to be putting that cold air into my tanks. So by the time the air gets through and into the tanks, it is heated up to room temperature. If you use anything too large, you're actually going to lose your pressure. So we need that, that middle ground. So we take that pressure from a four inch PVC pipe. You're also going to need water storage. Um, when you drain a tank, you need somewhere to put it. So we actually recommend another swimming pool or another tank. What you have, you just need one tank that you can dump all your water into so you can clean out your tanks, put your water back in and put your shrimp back in it. We also, um, you're also going to need storage for water in order to fill your tanks because you're going to have evaporation, spillage. So you're going to have to add maybe about, oh, I don't want, I'm going to say maybe 30 gallons every couple of months. Uh, salt, you're going to have to add maybe uh, two pounds to three pounds every three to four months. The shrimp do absorb some of the salt. You know, we also highly recommend an alarm system. Um, we actually use, um, we have our backup generator, which if we lose our power, but I don't trust the generators and our generator doesn't always start on time like it's supposed to. So we actually have an auto dialer that's set for seven minutes. So if my generator doesn't start within seven minutes, I get a phone call. If I get the phone call, I know that my generator is not started. So that gives me a quick heads up that we can get over here and we can manually start it. So I have kind of a backup alarm, but those are the only alarm systems I have because we really don't have any other issues. And you can get all the fancy alarms that you want, but sometimes the water itself or the bioflock will tend to make them go off because I'll be honest with you, we had alarm systems in each of our tanks. When we first started, I kept coming over a lot at two o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the morning and you'd walk in and there would be absolutely nothing wrong with the tanks. So I ended up taking them all out of the tanks because that was ridiculous. Talked about the generator, absolute, absolute must. An auto start generator is what you want. I have a generator on my house, but it hooks up to a tractor. And by the time I get the tractor warmed up, that's about an hour or two. Sad to say the shrimp are all dead in an hour. So we need an auto start generator. And like I said earlier, you might want that backup alarm. Also have the mobile texting on it. So it lets you know that it has started. We use radiant heat and I love the radiant heat because we literally run the PEX piping directly inside the tanks versus in your floor like you would your bathroom or your kitchen. By running them directly inside the tanks, we actually only heat the water inside the tanks. I'm not heating the air. I'm not heating anything I don't necessarily need. So it keeps my energy costs down. But what I love about the radiant heat, it's there's so many ways that you can use to heat with it. We actually have to use an LP um, tankless water heater. Uh, we cannot use windmills because in Benton County, we have a lot of windmills, so we can't be grandfathered in. Um, geothermal is one great way to do it. Um, we can't get geothermal where we're located. Um, solar, we've got several farms that are using solar energy to heat their farms, and it's fabulous. Um, there's, and then you can also use natural gas or electricity, but we use just a tankless water heater in order to heat those tanks. And they do keep it at a constant 26 degrees Celsius in the production tanks. You're going to need an electrical system, of course, because you're going to need it to run your pumps and your blowers or no pumps. I mean, you're going to need it to run your blowers. That's really all our electrical system does and to plug in for our, um, power washer when we go to clean salt. 
I'll be um, for a 14 foot tank. You're going to need on average about 500 pounds of salt. That's going to bring you up to 15 parts per thousand. We use the product Instant Ocean, but there are several other salt companies out there that are just as good. It's just that's what we started with, and it's just kind of like that's just what we stick with. You're going to need a water filter, of course, like we talked about earlier, having your water tested so we know what's in it. I'm not a water filter person, salesperson. I have no idea. Uh, the only thing I know about a water filter is it takes out the crap that I don't want in my water. But I am going to be honest with you. No water softeners and reverse osmosis are the absolute worst thing that you can ever use on these systems. An ROS system is, is fabulous for your house. But it takes out a lot of the stuff that's actually still important for the shrimp. Our main concern that we're trying to get rid of are minerals. Um, and those are the main things that we need to get out of the water. Because believe it or not, the harder your water, the better it is for the shrimp. So don't worry about the hardness of your water. That's actually better for the shrimp. Because if the shrimp's water isn't as hard as it should be, and if you really think about it, does the ocean have a water softener on it? Not that I know of. So the harder the, the water is, it means the, the harder their shell is going to be, which the harder the shell is, it makes it much easier for them to molt. And in order for them to molt, they need to be able to just to vibrate their body and shake the shell off. If they cannot do that, the shell will literally start strangling them or they will stress out and die because they cannot get that shell off. So this is why we actually add calcium carbonate to our tanks to even harden our water up even more. You're going to need a test kit. Um, you're going to need a dissolved oxygen reader. You're going to need a pH reader. You're going to need MOF cones, reagents to do your water testing. So those are things. Your test kit is, is basically a one-time purchase other than the reagents are a recurring purchase. Um, and you have to test every day for at least the first six months. After six months, if you understand the water, then... You can kind of stretch your testing out, but you never skip a day of testing, but you can stretch it out a little bit. Not do an ammonia test every day. We actually only do an ammonia test on Mondays. I have, I have no ammonia in any of my tanks, but I still test for it. I just don't take any chances, but I don't need to test every day. Um, we test for alkalinity three times a week and nitrites twice a week. Sundays, we just do meters only. So I'm in and out of our facility in about an hour and a half. So I, can, I have my Sunday to still do what I need to do. Then you're also going to need what we call accessory items. You're a cart, sump pumps, feed containers, calcium carbonate, baking soda. Those are the only additives we add to the tanks. One thing I don't have on this list here, sugar. We also add um, simple syrup to our tanks as a carbon source for the bacteria. Okay, now you're going to need a nursery tank. We've got your production tanks all set up. We're ready to go. Now you need to do nursery tanks. Nursery tanks are eight foot long, four feet wide, two feet deep. Ours are made with the same product we have in our walls, which is Duraplate. But we tell most people all you need um, plywood. Um, you can, I think it's two sheets, and you can get one tank out of it. But you want to make sure you marine base paint it. You're going to add an insulation. Sorry, I do not know the correct terminology for that pink insulation. You see it on the houses before they put up siding. And then you're going to want to insert a uh, pond food grade, least amount of recycled material, rubber liner into each of these tanks. Then we're going to use heat sticks in order to heat them, our aquarium sticks. It is the best way we found to heat the tanks. You do not want to heat the air in order to heat these tanks. If you heat the air to heat the nursery tanks, because we heat our nursery tanks up to 30 degrees Celsius or roughly around 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that room or area that you have your nursery tanks in is going to be like a sauna and it's just too hot to work in and we all know by human nature if anything's too hot to work in we're not going to do it we're going to find all the shortcuts that we can in order not to do the work that's human nature so we actually have um, our nursery tanks we're running six to ten of them right now but like i said hopefully we'll be up to 13 tanks in the next year after they leave the intermediate tanks, oh, also one other thing, put them up. Don't set them on the ground. If you set a nursery tank on the ground, you are bent over and it is the worst possible thing. My husband did that when we first designed these tanks. He had them on the ground. I made him lift them up. The mistake was he built them to his height, not my height. So I have to, to lean over quite a bit. 
in order to get them. But anyhow, these are pictures of our, inner, our nursery tanks, and we also run air in them as well, just using air stones inside of them to keep everything in suspension. When they leave here, they go to an intermediate tank, which is across the, in the picture you'll see, it's right across from it. It is a 14-foot round tank that we use for intermediates. Every single nursery tank is equivalent to one intermediate tank. And what they'll do, they'll stay in there for 25 days. And the reason we use an intermediate tank, I think it's too much stress on the shrimp to move them from nursery to production. When they are little, they love being crowded because we put anywhere from 10,000 to 17,000 in each of our nursery tanks, which are 400 gallon tanks. We could, babies love all the warmth that they can get, so they don't mind being crowded. So when we move them to intermediates, they're a 14 foot round tank, they have space, they're preschoolers now, so they don't mind being crowded. Now you put them into production tanks. Now when they turn 60 days old, which is how old they are when we put them into a production tank, they're 60 days old, they're now called juveniles. They're no longer called post larval, they're now called juveniles. And like any juvenile that we know, they don't like to be crowded. They like their little clicks and that's about it. And it's the same way with the shrimp. They don't like to be crowded. So by putting them into an intermediate tank, we can keep them together for at least 24 more days, get about another two to three grams worth of growth rate on them, and then throw them into production where we've thinned them down. They're going to grow a little bit faster and we can get them out the door. So by the time they're in production, they'll be there for roughly 60 to 90 days and they'll be sold out the door. This is just to give you an idea of what some of this stuff looks like. We have our test equipment, which is our DO meter, our production tanks, um, our lab. When you're setting up your lab, you really only need a four foot table, shelves above, a shelf below where you can store your feed. You do not want to store your pallets food in your lab because for one, it's gonna smell. Fish meal is not the best smelling thing on the planet and your feed's gonna have this fishy smell and you don't want that. Um, but it also, you wanna keep your feed in a cool, dry area, separate from your lab and your productions. And then you just need a three base sink to clean your equipment. The shelves above is a great place for storage. Depending on how you're going to use your system or what you're gonna do, it can cost you up to $100,000 minus your building. I cannot include a building in this at all because there are so many variables to a building. But 100K will actually cover your tanks, your generator, your regenerator blowers, if you hire consulting, your heat source. In reality, you're gonna be looking at about $65,000, but we say 100K because again, there are so many variables. Now this is based on an eight tank system. $100,000 is based on an eight tank system. So by doing that, the eight tanks is where we like to start people out because the whole first year is about building the bacteria. You establish the bacteria, then start your expansion. Once you get the bacteria, you're gonna have good survival rates. In the beginning, since you have no bacteria, your survival rates are gonna be low. So this is just an, an inexpensive way, baby steps in order to get started in the, in the system. But this includes everything but your building. Um, but the best way to get the numbers for this, I always recommend and tell everybody is to check out Profitability in Shrimp Farming by Professor Kwamina um, with C Grant with Purdue University. It is a great um, information packet on all your costs everything you're gonna to need to get started in this. It's a wonderful explanation, and we truly thank Professor Kwamina for being able to put this together. It is it's one of my best things I've ever seen out there as far as letting people understand what your costs are gonna be. And I'll be honest with you, your first year, it's gonna suck. I wish I could say something different, but it's not. Your first year is gonna suck. You're just not gonna have the survival rates. There's just no way. Now, if you do like a clear water system, you're gonna have a better survival rate than you will with the bioflock, but it's your second and third year where everything is gonna start changing and making it a much better time for you. I know I'm taking up a lot of your time and I probably am a little more confusing because I'm not in person. Um, so I'm talking to a screen and it's not actually my best thing to do. But anyhow, in closing, shrimp farming can be easy 
but it's also difficult at the same time. And the reason it's difficult is because you've got to pay attention to all those little bitty details. It's the smallest thing that can crash a tank, and that's what we're trying to avoid. So if you are looking to do shrimp farming, we hope you are. We want more shrimp farmers. I want to be able to go to a restaurant and eat shrimp in a restaurant. I cannot do it because the shrimp right now that we are eating is absolutely disgusting. But compared to mine, it is disgusting. And I always tell me, I raised pigs for several years. I get fresh pork. I still get fresh pork. I get it from my sister. She raises pigs. Do I still eat a pork chop in a restaurant? Yes, but I already know it's not going to taste good. But shrimp, the shrimp that we're eating now is literally disgusting. I cannot eat it but compared to, compared to mine. So I want more shrimp farmers. We really need them. But it's not an easy process. I'm not going to lie to you. It takes time. It takes time to build this up. You've got to do the baby steps in order to make this work. But you've got to pay attention to all the details. You can't skip the testing. You can't walk out to your facility and say, Oh, I see no dead shrimp. We're doing great. We'll just feed them. How do you not know you've got feed piling up at the bottom of the tank? And like a human, if I'm given the new steak or the old steak, I'm always going to take the new steak. But if I have feed piling up at the bottom, I'm going to force them to eat that old feed before I give them the new feed to help clean up the water. Because if you let the feed pile up, now you're going to end up with water quality issues. And then that's another thing you have to deal with. But you have got to maintain that water to the best of your ability. And that's all shrimp farming is about. You have bad water, you have bad shrimp. You have great water, you have fabulous shrimp. That's all it is about. So thank you very much. I hope I've not scared anybody off. That is not my intentions at all. I really think getting into shrimp farming, it's not difficult. But again, it's that time consuming and I don't know how you can say time consuming. You're talking three hours a day. I run 19 production tanks, seven intermediate tanks, and six nursery tanks. I have one employee besides myself, and I literally do most of the work. Um, three days a week, I'm here all by myself, and I'm done in less than three hours. So it's really not as difficult as a lot of people think. Because you're going to get your little routine down and be able to get it done. So if you're raising cattle or pigs or chickens or anything like that, this is a great diversification for you to add to your facility. This is a wonderful thing to add. And I mean, you can stay with eight tanks. It's just a little more extra income. And one of the other things I didn't talk about was tourism. Tourism is a great way to add income into your facility. But how to start a shrimp farm I hope I answered most of your questions. Um, please remember, I do have a handout that you can have. And thank you for letting me do it this way. And I am so sorry I couldn't be there in person. I was so looking forward to it. And again, thank you very much, Wisconsin, and have a great day. Bye.